YouTube. You can certainly type questions into that. We have people monitoring that. Uh, just know that we're, we're here for you the best we can be, uh, but we're so thankful that you've tuned in. Uh, we ask that, that God blesses you, that God multiplies his word, and, and that he does incredible things in your life for tuning in to Palmerdale Cross Live today. We love you, and thank you for your faithfulness. in a world filled with heartache and sorrow I found your love feeds my soul Father when I'm feeling I just can't face tomorrow I found your love feeds my soul Come on Gary Father in this world filled with heartache and sorrow I have found your love feeds my soul face tomorrow I have found your love feeds Let's my all sing soul out. I found your love feeds my soul I found your love feeds my soul it's better than life so I glorify you spirit within me cry out your name I found your love feeds my soul Father, when the stresses of this life weigh upon me, I found your love feeds my soul. Father, when my dreams laid in ruin before me, I found your love feeds my soul. I found your love feeds my soul. I found your love feeds So I glorify you, Spirit within me, cry out your name. I found your love feeds my soul. I found your love feeds my feeds my soul. I found your love feeds my soul. Spend the life so I glorify you, Spirit within me, cry out your name. I found your love feeds my soul. When darkness is wielding the sword of despair, I cry out to God, hear my prayer. And suddenly joy rises up from within, in the knowledge you'll always be there. I found your love feeds my, feeds my soul. I found your love feeds my soul. So I glorify you, Spirit within me, cry out your name. I found your love feeds my soul. I found your love feeds my soul. I found your love feeds my soul. Feeds my soul. Feeds my soul. Feeds my soul. So I glorify you, Spirit within me, cry out your name. You know this old.
And then when y'all did the key change, I was like, oh, we are having church. Key changes, that's how I know we're going to have church. When I hear a key change, we're good. Hey, happy Father's Day. Not like Mother's Day. It's a third cousin of Mother's Day, but happy Father's Day. Listen, ladies, if you, I just free. If you got your husband something to grill today, you making him work on his day. Just throwing that out there. I, I had a question. Like, How come... Daddies get grills for Father's Day, but if we gave our our mamas if we gave our mamas a vacuum cleaner for Mother's Day, they would come unglued. Y'all know that? There's just a little bit of hypocrisy I'm pointing out. Uh, but happy Father's Day, nonetheless. The most dad thing you could do today is have your family in church. It's the most dad thing you could do. So I'm excited to be able to worship with you today. On Mother's Day, we talked about um, women adorning themselves with glory. And we talked about the, the hair coverings and the head coverings from 1 Corinthians. Uh, on Father's Day, we're going to talk about how do we love like God expresses and tells us to love. So I'm encouraged today to be able to speak truth and life over you on this glorious day that God has given us to live in, dwell in, to serve in. So I'm excited. If you're a guest with us, welcome. It is our pleasure that you are here. We're excited. We hope that, that you connect with God. And when you came in, you should have received a card and allowing you to connect with us. If you would fill that out. And when the offering plate comes by at the end of our time together, let that be your token of worship today. I'm going to pray. And when I pray, um, our, our worship team's going to continue to lead. But this is the prayer that I'm praying over you this morning. I'm praying that the Lord would speak to the depths of your soul and help us understand what does it mean to refocus, to realign our lives, to love like God expects his children to love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's so great to be in this place. It's so good to be in your house. so good to be gathered with, with men who want to lead their families today on this Father's Day. It's also good to be with just our church family in celebration today as we celebrate another week and we get to worship you well. God, we pray as we are here, and we, we pray that we've gathered in the name of Christ. That's why we're here. God, we pray that you would adorn us with your presence. God, that we would fill the weight of your Holy Spirit in a way that changes our lives. God, we don't want to just check mark a box today and say we attended a gathering, but instead we want to submit our lives before you and say we worship the great I am today. We worship the King Eternal. We worship the one who tells the rain when to come or the sun when to shine. We worship the one who put the mountains in place and the stars in the sky. We, we worship the one who 
taught birds to fly and who taught fish to swim. We, we worship the one who created man out of the dust and breathed life into his lungs and looked at him and said, it's very good. We, we worship the one who even when we said, no, God, we don't want you and we sinned against you, you began a plan of restoration that brings us to the cross. And at the cross, our lives were paid for in full and all we have to do is accept you as our king, accept you as our Lord, uh, confess you as our Savior. And you, you take us and you call us your children. You adopt us. You rename us. And we're now yours forevermore. And so we, we praise you for those moments. So God, bless everything that we do this morning. May it not amplify man, but Father, may it raise the value of the cross in a way that lost people want to be saved. God, we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen and amen. Let's continue worshiping our Savior. You know, there's so many reasons why we even showed up today, and that reason is Jesus. Let's all stay. Raise my voice. 
worship I bring. You're the reason I live. You're the reason I sing. You're the reason I live. You're the reason I sing. Amen. You know, as fathers, oftentimes we, we're protectors. I think of when my daughter, who's getting ready to be a, uh, a, a wife here in a few weeks, months, a month, and uh, I remember her being a little girl, and I just remember holding her hand, and I, I, I just, I knew that she felt safe with me, and so I did a little something, I, I took my hand, and I had her old, older brother take a stick, and I said, I want you to just hit your sister in the hand as hard as you can. And he started wearing my hand out, trying to hit her hand. But she didn't feel anything because I was a protector. And I remember doing that. And, I, and I, that's how we oftentimes, as, as fathers, as Christians, we feel that way. Sometimes in our lives we feel like there's no hope. We feel surrounded by the enemy. But we have a God who is our protector. Y'all know this song, and let's sing this out. This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles yeah. This is how I fight my battles Please. This is how I fight my battles Sometimes you don't know where to turn it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I find my bad. This is how I fight my battles. 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 Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how we fight, amen. Amen. We fight on our knees. Let's sing. This is how 
has never failed me. Christ before me, Christ behind me. I'm not up. As a father, oftentimes our family turns to us for help. Dads fix everything, right? There are those moments when we are in a battle, fighting silently on our own, keeping a smile on our face so that our family feels safe and thinks everything is all right. In the midst, there are those times we feel we have nowhere to turn. We feel helpless. It's during those difficult moments that we turn everything over to God and rely on Him to bring us through. Listen as James Biggs sings the song, Helpless. Whoops. I wasn't created to live this life alone. Made for your glory, I am not my own. Lord, your strength is made perfect in me, so I'll boast in the weakness I see. I am helpless, helpless. My heart is crying out for you, Jesus, without your presence, there is nothing I can do, I'm helpless without you. Lord, in myself, I am not enough. I need your spirit, fill me with your love. All I am and all that I do is nothing at all without you. I am helpless, helpless, and my heart is crying out for you, Jesus, without your presence, there is nothing I can do. I'm helpless without you. I'm helpless without you. I'm helpless without your spirit. I need you, Jesus. I am helpless, helpless. My heart is crying out for you. Jesus, without your presence, I'm helpless without you. Lord, I'm helpless without you. Lord, I'm helpless without you.
We dismiss our kiddos to Children's Church. Follow Pastor Matt out through the Connect desk. If you're going to stay in here, meaning you're an adult, you can uh, grab your copy of God's Word and go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. Listen, I'm going to read a verse that was probably read at your wedding, all right? Um, and at some point, you probably stood in front of a preacher just like me, and, and he quoted this verse out of 1 Corinthians 13. And there's nothing wrong with that. that I do it all the time. If I've, if I've preached your wedding, I've probably read uh, Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 13. Very much so part of my, my, my resources, my, my repertoire for preaching weddings. Um, I preach that because I want people to understand the biblical definition of what love is. Because what our world teaches us love is is not necessarily what love actually is. The Bible defines love in a way that's transcendent to what our culture believes. But what I need you to understand today is this verse that we've popularized in weddings and, and that sort of thing. Um, it was initially written to the church for believers. It wasn't written to the church as, hey, this will, this will go hot in a wedding. Like, this is going to pop in the wedding. It's going to make everybody gonna be like, oh. You ever been to a bad wedding? You ever been at weddings when you were there like, this is awkward. Like, I was at a wedding one time, and the, the bride cried the whole time. I wasn't doing that wedding, Donnie. I wasn't doing that. I didn't preach that one. Like, I was like, somebody has this woman at gunpoint. Like, I, I was like, this is so awkward. It, and it wasn't like, I'm so in love. Mr. Frank, you're like, maybe she was just in love. No. It was like she was hostage. And I was like, this is awkward. And then it was, love is patient. Love is kind. And she's just snotting like a... Like, I was like, I'm nervous, right? So we, we use this, and we, this, is like, this is the wedding chapter. But it's not. It's not. Paul had no intentions of when he wrote 1 Corinthians 13 that it would ever be read at a wedding. It was always the, the declaration for the church that, that the church should be known, if nothing else, the church should be known by love. The good news of the gospel is that the gospel invades dark spaces. The gospel invades deep darkness and deep sin. And so when we are, when we are set free of that, that's called salvation. When we are set free from our sin and our iniquity and our shame, the Bible says there's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And when we are set free from the bondage of our carnal flesh, we are set free to love like Jesus. So the church, according to the Apostle Paul, should be known as a refuge of love. It should be known as a place of freedom. It should be known as a place where you can come in and no matter your story, no matter your past, no matter your last night, God's love is existent and the love should be existent in his people. But how many of you have been bitten in church? How many of you have had a bad experience in church? How many of you have been judged in church? How many of you have walked out going, those folks need to get saved, right? I had a deacon's meeting Thursday night. No, I'm kidding. No, it, wasn't, it didn't go like that. Sometimes the church doesn't always reflect the love of God. So Paul writes to the church, and remember, this is a story to the church. We're talking about realigning to God's word and to, and to God's worth. And so Paul is going to tell them you have to choose love. It's not something that you're going to naturally do. You have to choose love. And so this is what Paul says in verse 1 of 13. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have a prophetic power and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have faith so to remove mountains, but not love, he says, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver my body up to be burned, but I have not love, I've gained nothing. He says, love is patient and it's kind. It does not envy and it does not boast. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. 
As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. But we know in part now, since we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, the Apostle Paul said, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these, he says, is love. Father, let us love like you want us to love. God, we need to love so that our world knows that you're real. We need to love so that the world can see redemption. We need to love well because the people around us need hope and need confidence that our God reigns. And may the greatest testimony of our church not be that they're growing, not be that they're building buildings, not be that they're counting noses or nickels, but may the greatest testimony of our church be they love one another and they love their city. Teach us to love like you love. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen and amen. So Paul's talking about this subject of love. We sang love all morning. Everything we said and sang had, had love in it. We're talking about love today. And listen, I want to talk to men for a second because it's Father's Day. And I don't want you like, you know, most time when you come in on Father's Day, like, come in on Mother's Day, it's like, moms, you're superheroes. You come in on Father's Day, it's like, men, get it together. That's because men don't need a, like, we don't need a, you're doing a great job. Like, because no man's going to feel that. Like, if I stand up, I'm like, men, you're killing it. Just keep rolling. You're going to be like, I don't think I am. Like, you're going to know I'm lying. Like, you're just going to know he's not being truthful with me. So i got to be honest with you this morning. Like, we, men are like, I don't really love a lot. And yet you will stay glued to your TV the whole time your team's playing. And you use terms like we. You know how ridiculous it is that you use terms like we when we're talking about sports? We're getting beat like a tied up goat. We. 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 We bought a hot dog and a drink. We ain't, we ain't running nowhere. Like, and I'm, I'm just, I'm guilty. This is me confessing my trespasses that I can be forgiven. Like the other night, like last night, well, I, I'll back up. This week, Brother Jim. He's from Detroit. He's a Yankee. Um, <laughs> his beloved Tigers met the, the chainsaw that is the Atlanta Braves. They took the first game, and then we curb stomped them the second two, right? They got the first one. We gave them the first one because we felt bad for them. But now we're on a five-game winning streak. And there's times I'm like, we, we doing this. And there's times I'm entitled. I'm like, we doing this. And Katie's like, you're not on the team. And I'm like, first of all, ma'am, first of all, ma'am, uh, I buy a lot of merchandise. And I've eaten more hot dogs from the Atlanta Braves organization than I have any other team in the world. I have spent more money following the Bravos than anybody that I know. It's a we thing. And that she kept saying that. And then I realized I could buy stock in Liberty, um, who owns the Braves, so I'm a shareholder for the Braves. Yeah, that ain't a big deal. I, I'm not signing your Bible after church today. It's a we. Things that we love, we're passionate about. Like what will make a man go sit out in a tree spending all the money that it takes to go hunting? All the money you had to buy the gun, the scope. Ammo is ridiculous. You got camouflage on that makes you look like a tree. You ain't bathed in three days. You just, and now you're putting scent blocker on you. You've got $190 boots on. You're riding a $14,000 quad into the woods to go hunt something that you're going to have to pay $100 to get it processed. And then you're going to lie to your wife and say it's the cheapest meat out there. And you're lying through your teeth. Why do you do that? Because you love it. Don't tell me men don't love. Don't tell me that. You do. Because when your team gets beat by Georgia in the SEC championship or the national championship, you're not just like, well, shucks. That didn't go our way. You're distraught. You want, some of you, when your team loses in the Iron Bowl, you want to come to church the next day. And that's called adultery. We can, we can talk about that later. 
idol worship. Don't tell me you don't love. Men love a lot. Men love a lot. The, Paul is pressing and wanting us to know that the reason, the reason we're supposed to love is because it's going to be countercultural to everything else the world believes. That when we start loving people, not because they can do something for us, but because we have been bought with a price that's imperishable, we've been bought with the blood that's perfect, it has come to us and imputed to us a desire to love those around us. So Paul urges that, that your heart is more important than your efforts. Your heart is more important than your efforts. Some of us want to try to please God through our efforts when God has always asked us to come to him with our hearts. We want to come to him with our hands. We want to come to God with our hands and say, God, look at what I can do for you. But the problem with coming to God with our hands is that somebody can build something better than we can. Somebody can pay for something more than we can pay. Somebody can work longer than we can work. Somebody's more skilled than we're skilled. Somebody can sing better than we can sing somebody can do something at a greater level than we can do it but when we come to him with our hearts we come completely surrendered completely abandoned from self and say lord i am nothing without you he says your heart is what god wants it's your heart that, that god wants because he wants us to have words that reflect the love that he's given to us. Paul says, hey, if I can do all these things, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I can go and I can tell you the mysteries of mankind, if I can go and tell you all these things and show you all the wisdom, but I don't love you, he says, I'm nothing. He says, I, my words are useless not only must your words reflect love but your actions must reflect love too that i'm going to speak love but then i'm going to show you love and that sounds so easy right here doesn't it like when you're in church you're like yes pastor we're just going to go love and then you get in traffic and that person you've been sitting there like a good human being a good human and like you're now deep past the merge lane and then that person comes up and gets in front of you and throws that blinker on they ain't been sitting there for 45 minutes like you've been sitting there they just took the shortcut and now you're sitting there like i will total this thing before i let you in this lane we both gonna be calling Shinar before this day's over sometimes it's hard to show love Sometimes it's easy in our head, like, I'm just going to love everybody. But then you remember everybody, and you go, ooh. You know how hard it is to love people at a 5U baseball game? You ever been to a Little League game recently? Boy, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. I had a dad, like, trash-talking my boy last, yesterday. I ain't heard enough sermons, okay? <laughs> Don't talk about my kids. You can talk about me all day long. I'm used to it. I came out of a deacon's meeting Thursday. No, I'm kidding. It didn't go that bad. It was actually really sweet. I'm really excited about the direction of our church and, and God's blessing our deacons, and it's all really good. But when you talk about our kids, it's like, where, where are we meeting right now? Let's go. Let's go. We'll do it right now. Don't talk about my kids. Sometimes it's hard to show love to people. Sometimes if we're going to get real and honest, it's hard to show love to people. And yet God's word is commanding us, telling us, challenging us. The greatest thing you can do to point people to the God that you believe is to love them when they do not deserve loving. We want to be like, hey, I love people who love me first. That's not in here. That's not in here. I love people who can do something for me. That's not in here. That's, that's, it's not in here. Paul says, if you don't love people because you've been loved, then you're doing all the things for all the wrong reasons. You're trying so hard to do the right thing, but you're coming up short because your motives are wrong. And then he says, your efforts must reflect love. Your actions and your efforts must both reflect love. 
that I'm intentionally setting out. What I put effort into is something that I'm going to be intentionally pursuing. And if I'm not intentionally pursuing to love people like Jesus loves people, I'm going to fail. Because if I don't intentionally set my mind, I'm going to love people today. And then I'm going to remind myself on only hour, every hour, that I have to love people. Not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a believer. Not because I'm a preacher, but because I'm a child of God. Not because I want people to come to our church, but because I have been set free to love because Christ has loved me. It's not about my position in my vocation. It's about my position as a son of God that God has said, you should love people. And then he doesn't just leave it there. I love that God answers the question because our natural, our natural instinct is to ask the Lord, Lord, give me the bare minimum of what I need to do to satisfy you. Like a kid going up to their parents and saying, hey, tell me what I've got to do to clean my room. And the ultimate, what they're looking for is, what is the least amount of energy that I have to exude to make you not mad at me? And we do the same thing. God, what do you want me to do to, to love others? And, and Paul says, I will answer that question for you. He says, love is patient and it's kind. And right out the gate, the church is like, can we be honest? We're terrible at patience. We are. We are. And our world has made us even worse. Our world has made us even worse. We're living in a Chick-fil-A world in a McDonald's drive through We're all the time sitting here going, where's the bag hanging out the window? We want it all, and we want it now. I was watching somebody online. They found, a, they found one of them old cameras that we used in the 90s, the ones that you had to crank the back of. Y'all remember those? They found one. They're like, what is this? And like they, I mean, they went and asked their parents, like, what do you do with this? They're like, you have to go get the film developed. And they're like, what does that mean? Like they're a young kid, like 12, 13, asking their parents, what does that mean? You mean you can't just like look at the picture after you take it? And the parent was like, no, it was a complete mystery. You didn't know what the pictures were going to look like. And you had 17 pictures of your pocket. Yes. And then, like, you hope for five good ones. And it took two weeks to get them back. We live in a world where we don't do well with patience. Now, when you stop at a red light, the first thing somebody does is grab their phone. They're texting, and, and they're calling people, and they're tweeting, and they're Instagramming, and Snapchatting, and talking about how tough their day is. And meanwhile, I'm behind them laying on the horn. The light has been green for 1.3 seconds. You should be in second gear. We're not very good with patience. We're not. And yet he starts out and he says, love is patient. Do you know why Paul starts out by saying love is patient? Because he knew we didn't have any. He knew our inclination is just to let's go. Like just move it. And yet love is slow. Love is patient. And it's kind. It doesn't overthrow. It doesn't force its way in it says love is patient and it's kind it doesn't envy it doesn't boast it's not arrogant or rude it does not insist on its own way it's not irritable or resentful how many of you have come home irritable just just me just me today okay you ever walked in and your family's like what's wrong with them and then like this is what we do don we're like i'm not in the bad mood and my wife's like you need to go look in the mirror like you keep saying, your words don't reflect your actions. It says love's not irritable. It's not resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. But it rejoices in truth. It says love bears all things. It believes in all things. It hopes in all things. It endures all things. And then in verse 8, it's, it's one of the most powerful words in the Bible. It says love never, ever ends. And remember, he's not talking to a husband and a wife. He's talking to blood-bought believers who confess Christ. And he's saying, the goal of the church, the goal of Christianity, the goal of evangelicalism is love. And everything short of that falls on deaf ears. So if I go around and I tell everybody I know about Jesus, but I don't love them, they don't believe me. They don't believe me. 
If I go around and I, I build cabinets for people and, and wheelchair ramps and I do everything I can for them, but I don't love them, they won't believe me. We won't for very long serve people who we don't love. And so Paul is, is teaching and pleading with us that your, your heart is more, more important than your hands. And then he teaches us that love, love is void of selfishness. You can't be selfish in love. And listen, this will transcend into every relationship you're in. If you're only in a relationship for what you can get out of it, you won't be in that relationship for very long. Because at some point, people stop being an ATM for you. They stop giving you that which you're looking for. And if in that moment you can't be in relationship with them because you don't get something out of it, it was the wrong relationship to begin with. Paul says you should love people because Jesus loves people. Not because it's contractual. People love people because they can get them a job. But as soon as they got that job, they have no need for them. We will often treat humanity as stepping stones in our world than people whom God died on a cross for. And so he begins to tell us, look, you can't be selfish and tell people you love them. Love is being able to go, I love you in spite of you. I love you not because of you. There's an external force to why I love you. Because where we've got to come to is this reality. Love lasts long beyond our preferences. You know why changing people doesn't work? Because it's almost impossible to change people. I've tried. Husbands, you ever try to change your wife? Husbands, do you, do you know that your wives are constantly trying to change you? Mine's working on it. Like, guys, my wife is voodoo. I don't, I don't want to talk about it too much because she's in the room. We started out, we had this thing in our house that we said early on in our marriage, whoever cooked didn't have to clean. Y'all do that in your house? You're doing that in your house? If you cook, you don't have to clean? Y'all ever, ever do that? Some of you look at me like this is a brand new theory that you're trying to, like, what would this look like? Some of your ladies are like, this is a thing? My wife, without doing anything, has me cooking and cleaning. <laughs> I don't know how it happened. One day I was sitting there washing dishes, Miss Anita, and I was like, what in the world am I doing? Like, I've been washing dishes for 13 years. And now I'm like, oh, I'm cooking. I've got an apron and everything. I'm like, what in the world? How did this happen? She's, change, she's trying to change me. It's hard to get people to change that don't want to change. And sometimes we're in relation to people and we're expecting expectations to be different when they're not willing to meet us there. And we get frustrated about the relationship because our expectations are false. We've watched too many rom-coms in our day and we think everybody's going to live happy ever after and everybody wants to be our best friend. And that's not the call of the gospel the Word of God calls us to love people that God has created around us. And everybody, including that neighbor that you're not real happy that you have, and everybody in between, the Bible calls us to love people in spite of themselves. And not with hooks in them, hoping we can get something out of them, or, or not with, hey, we're going to make them a better person. But we love them where they are. And then we build relationships so that God can put us in a place to share His gospel, and we can see life change. We have to love past our preferences. Stop getting people to think like you think or vote like you vote. Instead, just love them because they're human. Love them because they're human, not because you get something from them. And then I'm done right here. He teaches this. He teaches that of everything in existence, love must remain. Love must remain. He preached this, love must remain. And I just need you to understand because like, this is such a fickle thing that we're talking about. Because in our hearts we go, yeah, we love people. But sometimes in our actions and in the heat of the moment, not so much. Not so much. 
Or this, we really love the people we love, but we really struggle with people that we don't. Like, so I used to, like, like people would, hey, you, you, ain't gotta, you ain't gotta like everybody, but you gotta love everybody. How many of you, your, a grandparent told you that? And I've said this before, I really struggle loving somebody I don't like. You there with me? Like, you, there are people in your orbit that drive you nuts. Can we be honest and say that's true? That's true. Some of them live in your house. Some of them are your family. Some of them are your coworkers. Some of them are your kin, your neighbors, who, whomever they are. Whomever they are. And sometimes you struggle with everything just trying to be in a room with them. And so you feel the weight. When I tell you to love people, you're like, that's easy. Like, I, I can love my wife. I can love my kids. I, I can love my best friends. And, and it's just easy. But then, like, that name comes up of that person. And you go, huh. 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 You ever seen the shirt that says, God loves you and I'm trying? <laughs> Sometimes we feel that. Sometimes we're like, ooh. Like you see them, like, you feel the call of the Holy Spirit. you got to love them. You're like, Holy Spirit, why don't you love them today, and I'll try tomorrow. I like try to pass that responsibility on, but he says love is patient, and it's kind of, and it endures. It endures. It goes to the end. Nothing in our world is permanent anymore, right? Like, nothing. Like, there's almost no more forever homes. How many of you are still living in a house that you lived in 25 years ago? That you raise your hand. A very small percentage of the room. Like now I'm watching like HGTV and they're like, and this is our forever home. And what's weird is when you're watching that, it's like, like the lady will come up and she's like, I'm a part-time substitute teacher. And the man's like, I basket weave and our budget's $1.9 million. I'm like what in the world are they getting for basket weaving these days? <laughs> Must be popping. Um, like, this is our forever home, or at least uh, for the next year until the cameras turn off, and then the bill comes and we can't afford it. Like, nothing's permanent anymore. We don't keep cars very long. We don't keep houses very long. Like, outside of paying taxes, there's not a lot permanent left in our world. And yet, the Apostle Paul is teaching us that love must abound and abide. It doesn't stop, it doesn't end, it doesn't turn off, it doesn't take weekends, it doesn't take holidays, it doesn't take vacations. Love exists and must be required at all steps of life. So you love the people that it's easy to love. But then he's going to tell us in press that we must even love those that don't fit that narrative. And he finishes this way. Love must remain, and so... Remember, this is not a sermon for a wedding. This is the sermon for the church. He's saying that the community of Christ should be known and marked by love. And yet, if you were to poll the culture and ask them the question, is the local church known for love? The answer would probably be a resounding no. They're not. Now, let's not get love twisted, okay? Love is not, I agree with you. Love is, I love you. I'm here for you. I'm present with you. It's this, I'm not going to be envious or boast. It's not, I agree with you. So like, there are people in my life right now that I'm loving, even though I completely disagree with the steps and, and things they're doing in their life. That does not mean I don't love them. In fact, I love them more because I'm the only person in their life telling them the, the truth. And sometimes love hurts, by the way. Sometimes you have to be the voice. Like, I, I find myself saying this more and more, Brother Jim. The, the longer I pastor and the older I get, I'm 35 now. Like, the older I get, I'm having to say this sentence a lot. At some point, you have to be the adult in the room and tell people the truth. Because if you don't tell people the truth, you don't love them. You don't. And sometimes the truth hurts, but that doesn't mean we don't speak it. Sometimes we have to tell the truth and be able to communicate it in love. Now listen, it's not judgmental. 
So you just don't kick down somebody's door and be like, hey, you're an idiot and you're going to hell. Like that's probably not going to win people for the Lord. It's not. But you got to love people through even bad decisions, bad choices, bad ways. And you have to love them so much that you're willing to say, hey, right now you're on a road that if we don't get off of it, it's going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to devastation. And the church should be known for our love more than we're known for what we don't agree with. Because this is what I found to be true. The more you love people, the more they'll hear you when you say, hey, you're going down a road that's destructive. You're going down a road that's devastating. You're going down a road that will lead you the wrong way. So the church should be known, but then the believer should be known as the same. A believer should be known for how they love. And then I'm done here. Part of the cross should be known as a safe haven of love. We get all the time, we get this feedback all the time. Hey, friendly church. And that we love that. So we love that you're friendly. Don't stop being friendly. That's a really quick way to kill a church. But more than that, we want to be known as a church who loves people. And I'm not talking about like we get you in and got you hooked. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in your worst day, we're standing beside you. Ready to pick you up off the floor, dust you off and say, let's keep going. I'm talking about in your greatest day, we're standing beside you, clapping and cheering and walking with you. And every day in between, knowing that you've got an army of people walking with you. In our culture, we've built a world that everybody must have it all together. Don't be weak. Don't be vulnerable. Don't be the one that people have to think about or pray for. In fact, so often it frustrates me to no end. It's the thing that gets me mad as a pastor. When somebody finally breaks and they're fixing to go into counseling, and I'm not talking about counseling. You should go to counseling if you need it. Sometimes you should go to counseling even if you don't need it. But when somebody comes up and says, I didn't want to be in imposition, so we didn't let you know. How can I fight for you in prayer if I don't know? How can I walk with you and encourage you? And how can I be a, a, a support for you if I don't know? The church isn't a place where you shouldn't be inconvenienced. In fact, church should be an inconvenience for you. And be okay with that of, hey, as the place is messy. Yes, we are. Because you're messy. And I'm messy. And we get together, we just have mess. Right, Miss Pam? We messy. Because broken people are messy. And the only thing that separates us from not being broken anymore is that Jesus Christ has died on a cross. And he's imputed to us a way to be saved. And by believing in him and confessing him as our Lord, we don't have to go to a devil's hell. But we've been set free and our feet have been set on a rock. And now that our feet have been set on a rock, we're no longer wayward. We're no longer in the far country. God has called us his children. That's what God did. All we did was say yes. So let me ask you today, have you said yes to that God? Let me, you can't love like I'm prescribing you to love without first knowing God. Because you can't love people in a way that you've never experienced that love before. You see, God's telling us to reciprocate that which he has already shown to us. He's not telling us to make it up. He's telling us to be the mirror. Be the mirror. You ever looked at a mirror and thought, that mirror's lying? You ever done that? I can't be the only one. I looked at a mirror the other day and thought, ooh, I don't look as sharp as I normally do. Oh, you know what I said? You know what I said, Ms. Nita? I said, that mirror's broke. That mirror's broke. The Bible calls us to be imitators of Christ. Be the mirror of Jesus. That because God loves you, you can love other people. Because you can't do this in the flesh. People are too messy. People can be too annoying. You can be too annoying. You can't do it in the flesh. We love in the Spirit. We love in the Spirit. We love in the Spirit. Because Christ loved me, I can love you. And we rest there. So if if you've never experienced that, we want you to come down. We'd love to talk to you about Jesus. If you've never joined our church, we'd love for you to come down. We'll partner in 
in ministry. If you've never surrendered to ministry and say yes to Jesus, Lord, I'm going to serve you. We would love to talk to you about that. Whatever the Lord has for you, we want you to respond. We want you to say yes to the Holy Spirit. If God is moving you in a way, we want you to say yes to however the Spirit leads. I'm going to pray. We've got musicians coming up. They're going to lead us in a song of response. This is just a song that, that gives you just a moment, about three to five minutes, for you to be able to hear what the Lord has been saying to you and for me to hush and you to be able to respond. This is your portion of the service to be able to say yes to the truths that have been spoken over you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the moments we've shared, for the word that was read. God, you challenge us to be truthful, to walk in love, to walk in a way that other people see the love that we have and the love that we share. Thank you for the word and the definition of love, that we can know what love is, not because of us, not because we're intelligent or wiser, but because of you. We know what love is because of you. And you call us to show that to a world. You call us to show that to people who don't deserve love. You call us to show that to people who are rude or careless or malice. You said, love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It doesn't keep wrong. It doesn't keep score. It doesn't rejoice in evil doesn't rejoice in wrong. Will you tell us about it, Lord, that it celebrates truth. It celebrates longevity. And you tell us that love never fails. May we love people like you love people today, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to ask you to stand and sing with us. If God calls you to move, we want you to move. Lord, I surrender everything to you. I love you, Lord. Father, we do indeed surrender everything we have to you, trusting you. God, as we come now to the portion where we're going to take up an offering, that we pray that we would even surrender our, our finances, our, our effort, our trying, our trusting. God, that we would be the church that you've called us to be. God, thank you for the chance to serve you today. Thank you, God, that you love us so much, that you're willing to die in our stead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We have some ushers who are coming down right now. This is time we take up our offering the faithful folks here at Palmetto Cross want to give and and they've given so well this year so so impressively well we're, we're gracious we're grateful um, we are we are a growing church and you're fixing to hear a lot about how we're growing and where we're growing and and how we respond to that growth and we want to be cautious in that but tell you the the truth that 
Um, part of being a growing church is uh, everything costs more. And we're so thankful that our church has responded to that. Our resources cost more. Our, what we're doing in children's ministry costs more. Everything costs more. And you have met that need and exceeded that need so well. Um, I've been in finance meetings when it wasn't fun. Um, the finance meeting I was in this week was glorious to hear how our saints give and give graciously. And I was talking to one of our ministry partners Friday, and they called just to check in with us to see how things were going. And, and uh, they said, Jeff, thank you so much for the way your church is giving. You're far beyond what we gave them a number that we hope to give them, and we're far beyond that already. And it's just amazing to see the gloriousness of God's people when they get serious about giving, about how the, the gospel goes around the world. So that happens because of you and me. When we get faithful in our giving, um, that happens. And so if you're our guest today, we didn't invite you here to give, so don't feel any pressure about giving. If the Lord lays it on your heart, be faithful. But if not, like our people are not going to like awkwardly be in front of you. Just take it and pass it. You're fine, we promise. Um, our giving is our response back to how good God's been to us. Lord, thank you for the chance to give. Bless these tithes and offerings. Use them to feather your name around the globe. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I have a couple of announcements. Is Patricia here? Do you want me to do that one too? Okay. Um, so the first one, we have PC Kids Camp next week. It starts Sunday. If you have a child that you haven't registered, if you will pre-register them before Saturday, I'm going to turn the online link off then, and you'll have to fill out one of those long dreaded pieces of paper with a pen if you don't do it before Saturday. So if they finished pre-K 4 through the end of fifth grade, they are welcome to attend. Um, we have a ladies DIY homemade craft night on June the 30th, which is not this coming Friday, but the next at six o'clock. It's $5 per person. You can pay me or Amber or Susan and she'll be back there somewhere. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the last thing that I have, we do have a Father's Day gift that's going to be in the connection room over here for y'all. So if you are a father, you can come by and pick one of those up on your way out. All right. Has it been good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming on this Father's Day to celebrate with us. No matter what today brings, we hope it brought you love, grace, and joy in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So as you go today, wherever you go, make much of Jesus, and we hope that the Lord would bring you back this way. Um, don't forget, be in prayer. We, we're a week out from Bible school. Uh, we, it starts a week from tomorrow. We want you to already be praying that the Lord will speak to the depths of our children and that we would see kids and teenagers and even adults saved by the power of Jesus. All right? Go with God, and we will see you when we get to see you next.
for staying with us to this point. We're so thankful for people who, who watch what we're doing. And we want to invite you to join us live in person at 4950 Fawcett Road in Pinson, Alabama. Uh, we invite you to come and, and, and experience what we do in person and see our praise team live and, and all of that. Uh, so you're invited to do that. We hope that you would take a chance right now to give to Palmerdale Cross. Part of what God calls us to be as his stewards, as his people, is someone who, who gives back. And you can do that on our website. There's a link in the video below, palmerdalecross.org. You can give right there and continue to further the kingdom. All of this, all of this content takes so many hours every single week, and our tech team does an amazing job. So as you give and you give to our church, that, that enables us to keep putting out information like this. I know that we love you. We're here for you. If you have any questions for us, you can email us at info at palmerdalecross.org and we'll respond to that. We love you. Thank you for tuning in today. Have a great week.